All right, here we are, uh, Hebrews, The Glorious Jesus, that's the series that we're in. This is lesson three in that series, and the title of this particular lesson is Jesus Greater Than the Angels. This is part two of that particular lesson. We'll be looking at uh, Hebrews chapter one, verse four, and just uh, you know, moving on to uh, chapter two. Uh, just as a, a way to review the material that we've been talking about, uh, the book of Hebrews, uh, written to first century Christian Jews who were contemplating returning to Judaism because of the persecution they were experiencing as Christians. Uh, and so the, the writer, the author, uh, writes to these Jewish Christians and encourages them to be faithful by demonstrating that Jesus Christ was superior to every element of their former Jewish religion. Don't go back to Judaism, he says, because Christianity and the core of Christianity, Jesus Christ Himself, is greater than all the elements of Judaism. So don't go back to that, stay with Christ. That's the, that's the core of his, uh, of his argument. And so he begins that argument by showing how Jesus, for example, is superior in position and in nature to the prophets, which were very important in uh, the Jewish system. Then he goes on to demonstrate that according to Old Testament prophecy, Jesus the Messiah was considered greater, not only uh, greater than the prophets, but also greater than the angels. Now this was an important point for the Jews since angels in their life, in their understanding, in their experience, represented a significant part of their contact with supernatural beings. And may have been, they may have been tempted to consider Jesus as a, an angelic being rather than a divine being, as the Word uh, taught, as Jesus and the apostles taught. So once the author describes Jesus' rightful place at the right hand of God, far above the position of the angels, he warns his readers concerning the significance of this. And so he explains the reasons why this exalted Jesus took, for a while at least, a position lower than the angels. Because this was a, another idea difficult for Jew, uh, Jews to accept. You know, they could accept, okay, well, Jesus is greater than the angels, He's above the angels, okay, maybe I'll accept that. But now, why did He take a position lower than the angels? So the author is going to explain that idea in the following chapters. Now before we, we get into the text, I need to explain a little bit uh, about how the book of Hebrews is written, some of the devices that the author uses in introducing new ideas. So we need to understand that the author uses several devices to introduce material in his uh, epistle. For example, in chapter one, verse four, to chapter two, verse 18, the general idea that he's talking about is that Jesus is greater than the angels. But within this general theme, he introduces another idea which he will not um, elaborate right away. He'll only elaborate on it in a couple of chapters. Now he usually does this at the end of the chapter, so readers need to be ready for it when, you know, when we get there. Now I call this device a hook word or billboarding. You know, uh, you're driving down the highway, you see a sign, you know, McDonald's, next exit, that's billboarding. You know, the McDonald's is not right there. It's telling you that you know, pretty soon you're going to arrive to a, a spot where you can take an exit and go to McDonald's. Well, he does the very same thing here. He, you know, he's in a certain chapter, a certain part, and he'll introduce a word or an idea that billboards what's coming in the, in the not too distant future of his, uh, of his writing. So an example is in chapter one, verse 14, in talking about angels, he mentions the idea of the angels serving those who will inherit salvation. Oh, so that word salvation, there's the hook word, there's the billboard. He doesn't talk about salvation right away, but he introduces the word and the idea here and we'll discuss it and develop it a little bit further down the line. In chapter two, he'll elaborate not on angels, but he uses the introduction of the word to make a parenthetical statement about salvation. Okay, so uh, if we go to, if we, uh, if we go to um, uh, uh, verse one in chapter two, uh, we'll see a kind of a, a warning there. You know, Jesus is greater than the angels, therefore, okay, verse one, for this reason, okay, uh, 
Jesus is greater than the angels. Right? For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. And so we must pay attention to what we have heard and avoid the danger of drifting away from it. It's like an arrow that slips off the bow, if you wish, or a boat that slips past a safe harbor. The idea is that drifting away from the truth. Okay, verse two, he says, um, so uh, here's uh, the, the point he's making is, we've heard all right, the information about salvation and we have to be careful not to drift away from that. So let's go to verse two, it says, for if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. So here's the reason why he says that they must pay closer attention. Um, and, and he brings in the idea of, of angels. He says, what was spoken through the angels, for example, to Abraham concerning Sodom and Gomorrah and its destruction, or the law that was given through the angels, right? Paul talks about that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. The point that he's making is, if these words were required to be obeyed and God punished without exception those who disobeyed, see what I'm saying here? He's saying, look, you need to pay attention because the word that, that came through the agency of angels, if it was disobeyed, was punished. All right, so that, he set that up. So let's go to verse three and four. He says, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. So he continues the thought. He says, if the word spoken through angels and ignored was then punished, how will they escape who neglect the words given by the Son of God, who is higher than the angels? not only spoken by the Son, but preached by the apostles and confirmed by miracles. In other words, if God punished those who disobeyed the word spoken by angels, imagine the result for those who neglect. Neglect means uh, 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 believers, uh, believers are the ones who neglect. Uh, unbelievers cannot neglect the word, they reject the word. They don't believe it, they simply reject it, but believers we accept the word, but then we neglect it. We don't pay attention, okay? So the word of salvation, of course, which is superior to the law, uh, uh, because it gives forgiveness and it gives life. And it was spoken by the Son of God, who is superior to the angels. And it was confirmed, he said, by apostles and miracles. So the warning is that if even the angels did not escape punishment, those who neglect the word spoken by Jesus will not escape either. It's a kind of a balance. It's a warning. Pay attention. Be careful. Don't neglect the word. Because uh, uh, those who neglected the word spoken through angels, they were punished. Even angels were punished who neglected the word. Imagine it's going, uh, what's going to happen to those who neglect or reject the word spoken by someone who's higher than the angels. Okay, Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's described Jesus' position um, 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 above the angels, uh, and now he's going to explain why Jesus took for a while a position below the angels, which is man's position. And he does this by first explaining the position that man has according to God. So he's given the warning, all right? Uh, he's given the warning, now he's going to move on and explain why did Jesus take a position lower than the angels, the man's position? And in doing so, he's going to explain what man's position is. So he says, for he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. So in speaking of man, the author alludes to the fact that in the future, man will inherit with Christ a new world order, not the angels. It's not the angels that's going to inherit the world, it's man that's going to inherit the world. The new heavens and earth where Christ is King and Lord will have His disciples who will reign with Him. 
not the angels who will reign. It says, for if we died with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 11 and 12. And so the idea is, okay, let, so, so uh, Jesus takes a position lower than the angels for a time. That's man's position. Well, let me tell you man's position. Well, man's position is lower than the angels now, but in the future, man will inherit the new heavens and the new earth. Man will be above the angels, even if for a time man is below the angels now. Okay? So let's read verse uh, six to eight. It says, but one has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you're concerned about him? You've made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. So, you know the vague introduction where he says, but one has testified, you know, that's a kind of a vague introduction. This was a common literary device that emphasized divine origins. You know, uh, and of course the Hebrews, the ones he's writing to, they were very familiar with the psalm that he's talking to, would be Psalm chapter eight, verses four to six. Um, a little bit like when we say, well, you know, the Bible says, uh, for God so loved the world, right? Do we quote John? Do we even say it's in, in, in the New Testament? Do we say John 3, 6? No, we just say, well, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. Why? Because the people we may be talking to, they know that passage. Well, it's the same thing. The people he's talking to, they know the passage that he's referring to. So the psalm, in its original context, referred to man and his position in God's creation. So man's original position is at the head of creation, below the angels, with dominion over the earth. That's man's original position, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 30. Now, God isn't putting angels in charge of the world to come. He's putting man, man who originally was in charge of creation, will, and a little below the angels, will ultimately be above the angels and at the right hand of God in charge of the new heavens and the new earth. All right, let's go to 8b. He says, for in, subjecting, for in subjecting all things to Him, He left nothing that is not subject to Him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to Him. So here he summarizes the idea that all things are subject to man. What isn't written but understood is that man fell from his position because of sin and his dominion over all things is severely cut back, right? We read about that in Genesis 3.16 and verses 17 and 19. So the author says that we don't see man as that ruler now, but he hints at man's return to glory. Yes, man is a little lower than the angels. He was put at the head of creation. Because of the fall, he, you know, he's lost a lot of what he had at the beginning, but in the future he will be once again above the angels and he will be at the right hand of God. So the author is describing Jesus' position below the angels for a time and he begins by explaining man's situation and hope for future return to glory. Again, billboarding uh, what's coming ahead. So now he's going to talk about Jesus' position. In the following verses, the writer describes Jesus' position and the reasons why he took such a low position. Now, in the original context, the psalm in verse six to eight talked about man. Now the author takes this scripture and he shows how Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of these words. It's like, a, a, it's like a, uh, that passage, it has two stage, it's like a two-stage rocket, if you wish. The first stage you know, blasts off and gives the idea of the position of man, and then the first stage falls off. The second rocket then ignites and pushes it even further to give the meaning concerning God's uh, position in a prophetic sense, speaking of Christ. And um, uh, the author matches the facts of Jesus' life and death to give the passage, you know, this passage in Psalms, its prophetic meaning. Um, so at the beginning, he uses the psalm to describe man's position from a historical perspective. And then he goes back and shows how this passage also demonstrates Jesus' position uh, from a prophetic standpoint, okay? 
verse nine. Now we don't yet see man's glory, but we do see Jesus. So let's look at this. He says, but we do see Him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. So he's not talking about man anymore. He's not talking about man who was head of creation and then fell and then has hope in the future to rise above that. Now he's going to talk about Jesus, and then we go back to the passage, because of the suffering of death crowned Him with glory and honor so that by the grace of God He might taste death for everyone. So we don't yet see man's glory, but what we do see is Jesus, made for a while like a man, you know, lower than the angels. We also see His glory and honor following His death. So His death, there, whoops, there's another hook word that will you know, be discussed in a moment. He's billboarding what his next idea is going to be. So without mentioning it specifically, the author refers to the resurrection, which was the basis of preaching through which his readers came to faith. They don't see man's glory, right? Not yet. They don't see you know, the man's final glory where he'll be above the angels at the right hand of God, over the new heaven and the new earth. They don't see that. But, he says, they do see Jesus, who, like a man, dying and then being raised from the dead to a position of glory and honor. In other words, you don't see man's future glory, but you have witnessed Jesus' glory. So the author is going to show how this will ultimately mean glory and honor for man also. But first he returns to deal with the subject of death that he introduced earlier. Uh, subject of death, you know, it's like a, like a subfile. He, he talks about death and then he pauses and says, well, okay, let's, let's open a subfile. We need to talk about death here, okay? Um, let's me, all right. So he says, the point that the author is going to be making about Jesus' death is that it was an honorable death, a death that led to glory. In other words, Jesus' death was not a deserved death, like man's death. You know, men suffered death as a result of their own sins, right? The wage of sin is death. It's a dishonorable thing. Jesus' death, the author is going to explain, was substitutionary. It was the sins of other people that caused His death, and so He suffered a personal death for other people's sins, and thus was not a shameful death, um, because of his own personal sins. You see the idea? Now this, this is an important point because the death of the Messiah was an obstacle to faith for Jews. That's why he, you know, when he talks about the fact that uh, they're going to see future glory after death, and then he talks about the death of Jesus, you know, he has to stop there, open a, a, a subfile to explain. Well, let me explain about Jesus' death here because he knows that this is a stumbling block for his readers. Uh, they stumbled over the fact that Jesus was crucified as a common criminal by a foreign army. This was a very persuasive argument capable of shaking their faith. You know, their Jewish uh, family and friends would be saying to them, really, really, you, you're placing your whole spiritual life, your future life, your soul in the hands of somebody who was you know, executed by a pagan army in a shameful way, this is your Messiah? So it's, it's, it's one reason why the author tells them to pay special attention to the gospel. In other words, listen carefully to the gospel and what it means. This is why the author mentions that his death was according to the will and the purpose of God, and it was substitutionary in, pur uh, in purpose. In other words, yes, Jesus died, but he didn't die for the reasons that ordinary men die. Okay? So in verses 10 to 15, the author is going to explain the relationship between the suffering and death of Jesus and the salvation of man. Remember, he talked about man's salvation. Well, man's salvation is linked to the death of Jesus. So before he explains how these two you know, work together, he's going to have to do some explaining about the death of Christ and how this was not a dishonorable thing. Okay? So he does this to make the concept of a suffering Messiah acceptable to them. And so he says three things about the suffering of Jesus. So let's read verse 10. Come on. It says, um, there it is. So first of all, he says, the suffering was according to God's will in verse 10. 
It says, uh, let's see, for it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. So the first thing he says is, you know, the suffering was according to God's will. It was fitting, meaning according to God's plan and nature, to equip Jesus completely for the task of saving man. You know when it says bringing sons to glory? That's just another way of saying bringing salvation to men. You know, I've mentioned this to you before. The Bible many times uh, says the same thing in a variety of ways. So saving man, bringing sons to glory, all means the same thing, saving man. And so in order to save man, the author says death was necessary, and he's going to explain why later. God fully prepared His Son for this suffering by equipping Him with a human body and a human nature. Perfect means to equip completely. He wasn't just half a man. He wasn't only a spirit appearing as a man. He was a real man. He was a flesh and blood man with a nature of man, but He was also divine. That's when He says perfect, means a perfect combination. The author is going to go on to say that in his humanity, Jesus was fully human, meaning that he was fully capable of suffering. Jesus is higher and superior to angels, but when he became a man, he also fully shared man's inferior position beneath angels. Okay? This was also according to God's will and God's word. All right, let's read verse 11. He says, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Okay. Sanctified means to set aside for a special purpose. God's purpose for us is that we become His children. Now, through the, the um, uh, sanctification that we have obtained through the suffering of Jesus, we have become God's children. We have become set aside for God's purpose as God's children. How? Through the suffering of Jesus. He comes down to take on a humanity, a human form, and in doing so, He raises us up to take on His spirituality. Okay? He comes down, we come up. In this way, we become united having the one Father. He is not ashamed of us. Now, the writer will continue to support the idea that Jesus became fully human by quoting several Old Testament passages. So he does this in verse 12, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. So that's from Psalm 22, verse 22. This was a psalm of deliverance, a prayer for help and praise for answer. So Jesus also prayed when suffering and now declares salvation among His brethren like a man. In other words, He suffered like a man. Um, next uh, passage in uh, verse 13, and again I will put my trust in Him, and again behold, I and the children whom God has given me, Hebrews 2.13, quoting Isaiah 8.17 and 18. The Old Testament context, as I say, comes from Isaiah and uh, the two sons that Isaiah, um, Isaiah had. Now I have to know a little bit about Isaiah's situation. He was distressed and rejected by a disobedient people. The prophet then expressed these words to affirm his faith in God, and he looked to his own two children as witnesses to the salvation that God would bring. He named them, he gave them special names, and they had, their names had a special meaning in regard to Israel and what would take place in Israel. And so the author, he sees both David and Isaiah's words as illustrations of higher truths. For example, the Messiah's complete trust in God as all men should have, and the Messiah's willingness to associate with God's sons as a human being. So the writer, he puts these words into Jesus' mouth, so to speak, in order to demonstrate that he responded to God as a human being. You know, he, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, you know, he's talking to God as a human at this point. This is done as a defense against accusations that Jesus was merely a vision 
or perhaps an angelic being that appeared here on earth. And through these passages in the Old Testament, uh, the writer is demonstrating that Jesus was fully man. He spoke to God the Father as a man would speak to God the Father. And so the author here is echoing John's word. You know, in John chapter 1, verse 14, you know, John said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, this is the Hebrew writer's way of saying the same thing. He came below the angels for a time. He related to God as a human would relate to God. He mingled among men. He was not ashamed to be among men. And he adds, as I say, these Old Testament scriptures to support the idea that this was all in line with what the prophets said. The prophets said that the Messiah would be human and he would suffer all these things according to God's, according to God's will. Okay, I know that's a lot, you know, I know that's a lot, but let's stay with me. Okay, so now, remember, he's talking about suffering and death. He's kind of opened a new window and he, he says, uh, you know, there's a relationship between Jesus' suffering and death and the salvation of mankind. But before I explain that relationship, I need to kind of explain why did Jesus suffer and how did He suffer and what's the meaning of, of His death? Okay, so now the next point he's going to make about this issue is the results of his suffering. All right? The author has established the idea that the uh, incarnation was according to God's plan and as man, Jesus was fully human. Now he goes on to explain the accomplishment of Jesus' suffering in verse 14. Uh, let's read that, shall we? It says, um, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So he repeats the idea uh, of Jesus' need to become like those he wished to save. And he shows that death, um, as a human, was necessary in order to destroy Satan's power. Okay, so that's kind of a, a new uh, idea here. Um, in other words, Jesus had to be a human being in order to suffer. He, he couldn't suffer as an angel. He couldn't suffer as, as simply as, uh, as God, the Son. He had to become human in order to experience suffer, and he had to suffer in order to destroy Satan's power. Okay, this is what he's explaining here. So let me give you a little background here. Uh, what the readers of this epistle kind of understood by what he's saying here, we need to understand. So I'm going to digress and uh, talk about the power that Satan has over death. All right? So Satan has power over death in that he has control over the thing which causes death, which is sin. In other words, Satan tempts man to sin and sin is then punishable by death. You know, the law says, Romans 6, 23 says, the wage of sin is death. That's a spiritual law. You sin, you die. Well, Satan has the power to tempt, to seduce men into sin and therefore uh, uh, bringing them into condemnation and death. See, the problem is Satan is much more powerful than unregenerated man. Man without the Spirit of God, man without the gospel of Christ has no power, no chance against Satan. So Jesus was sinless, right? First Peter chapter 2, verse 22. Jesus was sinless and so His death is not a deserved punishment. Rather, it becomes a payment for the sins of other people. You see, we die with a debt outstanding, a moral debt outstanding for the sins that we've committed which then condemn us a judgment. But Jesus dies with no debt, and so His death can pay for the sins of other people. Now that there is a payment for sin, several things happen. Number one, Satan has no power over death because the thing he controls, sin, right, which brings death, now has a neutralizer, and the neutralizer is the death of Christ. In other words, there is an antidote to the poison of sin, and that is the death of Christ. Satan continues to lie, of course, and seduce and deceive men into sin, but there is now something that removes all sin, 
and that's Jesus Christ, and therefore this destroys Satan's ultimate power. This is what he's talking about here, the power of death. Jesus destroys this power of death. All right, so let's go to uh, verse uh, 15 in, in Hebrews chapter two. It says, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. So men are free from slavery caused by the fear of death. So the problem is I sin, I know if I sin I die, I know if I die with sin I'm condemned, but I can't help sinning. You know, that's the dilemma, that's the fear. Men are free, uh, the writer says, finally, from slavery caused by the fear of death. Before there was no solution to sin, and so death was inevitable. Through his death and its effect on sin, men no longer needed to be afraid of death caused by sin. Why? Because there's a payment for sin now. So without death as their inevitable end, men are free to be sons of God and take their place with Christ at the right hand of God in future glory. In other words, there's a reason and a way that men are going to go from being below the angels, condemned to die, condemned to punishment, they're going to go from there to being above the angels with Christ at the right hand of glory. And the way to get there is through the suffering and death of Jesus. This is why he has to explain you know, all the components. Okay? It's interesting to note that the Greeks were very concerned with death and they referred to their burial grounds as Nicopolis. Nicopolis means the city of the dead, right? That's how they referred to their to the, the burial places. But with the advent of Christianity, the term that began to be used was cemetery, which means sleeping place. So you see the, the ideas began to change. Okay, the third thing that he now says, remember we opened that box about suffering and death, third thing that he says about it is, su the suffering Messiah is the actual correct view of the Jewish Messiah, okay? Now remember our original point in all of this is to show that a suffering Messiah is honorable and legitimate because this idea caused a lot of doubt to the Jews. In the last verses, the author goes on to show that far from being a shameful thing for the Messiah to suffer, it was actually the ultimate fulfillment of every aspect of their Jewish religious system and a perfect sign that the Messiah can help them now as they suffer persecution. So let's read verse 16, shall we? It says, for assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. So the Jews understood their position below angels and their need for a savior as, a sinful, as sinful men and God's promise of salvation. They understood that part. In verse 16, the author establishes that man, and for the readers, Jews in particular, that man and salvation and God offered this salvation to them, but not to angels. So yeah, you're below the angels, but he doesn't offer salvation to the angels, he offers it to you, okay? Um, and that Jesus' suffering was for them, not for angels. So now in uh, chapter two, verse uh, 17, he says, therefore he, had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So now he refers to what they know about how God dealt with sin, by offering of a sacrifice by a priest. You know, uh, what do they know about you know, offering a, a sacrifice for sin? Well, they know plenty. I mean, their whole religious history is filled with this, the offer of animals you know, by priests. Now, note another hook word here has appeared that he's going to expand a little bit later. You know, he's going to talk about the high priest. All right? He only mentions it now in context with suffering and sacrifice. You know? So he says, you people, you know about sacrifice. You know about this system. You've, you've seen this. This is nothing new. A sacrifice offered for sin by the high priest. So the priest, you know, in, in their mind, in their religion, was a go-between or mediator between God and, and the people. 
Uh, his interface with the people was the fact that he was a human being and he understood their weaknesses. Uh, much of what he wore uh, was symbolic that he carried the people and he carried their cares and burdens and sins upon himself. His interface with God, while well, he was set aside for exclusive service by God to offer sacrifice on behalf of the people for sin. In other words, he served exclusively in the temple. He was set aside, he didn't work, he didn't own any land, he, he didn't have a business, anything. His only work was on behalf of the people before God in the temple. So here's the argument. The argument was that Jesus had to become a human and experience suffering and temptation so that, like the priest, he would be able to understand their weaknesses and empathize with them. So basically he's saying, you people know about sacrifice for sin and so on and so forth. You have the priest, he's a human, he understands, he's a human like you. Well, he said Jesus had to become lower than the angels, he had to become a human, why? Well, first of all, he had to have some understanding of what it was like to be a human being, a personal experience of that, just like the priest has a personal experience of how you feel. And like a priest, he offered sacrifice on behalf of the people. Here he shows how Jesus is similar to the high priest, but later on he's going to demonstrate how Jesus is superior than high priest. He's already talked about Jesus superior to the prophets, Jesus superior to angels. A little later on he's going to talk about Jesus superior to priests, but for now he only compares the work of the priest with the work of Jesus. So the point in this verse, however, is that according to Jewish religion, a sacrifice for sin was an honorable thing ordained by God to deal with sin. They had a whole history of this. The author states that the death of Jesus for the sin of men by comparison is also an honorable thing, totally in line within the Jewish system. Now later on he's going to show how even Jesus' sacrifice is superior, but for now only the fact that it isn't a shameful thing. Remember our original idea. He's trying to show that the suffering and death of Jesus is not a shameful thing, because suffering and death, especially the way He died, was considered shameful to the Jews. Now in verse 18 he says, for since He Himself was tempted in that which He suffered, He is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So at the end, he injects a, a kind of an exhortation, an encouragement. Since the human Savior suffered as part of His work to save man from sin, it means that He is able to understand human suffering. He's able to understand your suffering now and He can help you with it now. And so He subtly refers to their persecution and reminds them that a suffering Savior is well qualified to help them through this difficult time. Okay, so let's kind of summarize here. Within the context of the idea that Jesus is greater than angels, the author introduces the concept that He was also, for a time, lower than the angels. And during this time, He shared not only human nature, but He shared human suffering. Without leaving His eye on Jesus as divine and the Son of God, exalted above the angels, the author says the following things about Jesus when He took for a time a position below the angels for a human being. Number one, he says, this was according to God's plan. In other words, according to God's plan, the Messiah had to become human, lower than the angels, in order to save man. Number two, he says, His suffering produced important and necessary results. For example, his suffering ultimately uh, uh, destroyed the power that Satan had over sin and death because his suffering led to a, uh, a, 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 um, um, a sacrifice for sin that pays the moral debt of man. And once man's moral debt is paid, Satan's power is broken. So he says his suffering was important and it was necessary because it did that and also it freed mankind to become children of God. They were no longer simply fearful of death and condemnation. They, despite their imperfection, could become children of God. So his suffering and death 
produced very positive results and therefore was necessary. And thirdly, his suffering was in accordance with the basic concepts of Jewish religion. You know, when he says, look, you people understand the idea of sacrifice, you know, sacrificing for sin. Well, here Jesus is sacrificing. His death was not because of his own thing, his sins. It was not a shameful thing. It was a sacrifice, all right? It was a sacrifice on behalf of all men's sins. And it falls completely in line with the concept of you know, the Jewish concept of sacrifices made for sins. Okay, so we've learned a lot about the theology of the incarnation and the atonement and how these were the true fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy and the real substance of the Jewish sacrificial system. But you know, we're not Jews. You know, the things I told you, those were lessons for the Jews. Uh, we're not Jews, we, we don't see the death of Jesus as a stumbling block for us. You know, uh, we're, we're not, we didn't grow up with a sacrificial system, so we're, what's in it for us? What lessons for us in this you know, quite complicated passage? Well, lesson number one, we need to pay attention. You know, they had to pay attention because they were not paying attention to what the gospel actually taught, they were tempted to kind of drift back into Judaism. Well, we have to pay attention to what we have heard. We need to be careful to pay attention to what Jesus teaches, uh, uh, lest we drift away from it. Now, uh, they were not paying attention to the word of God, and so they were tempted with arguments that it was shameful for a Messiah to die on the cross. Well, we're also tempted, not with the, the term that you know, it's a shameful thing for Jesus to die on the cross, but we're tempted uh, by sophisticated philosophies that uh, repudiate God's word or cast, upon, uh, cast doubt upon the divinity of, of Christ or the reality of sin and judgment. You know, we're scoffed at, we're mocked at. So we, we today, we need to pay closer and closer attention to God's word, lest we drift away from it. We need to understand God's word so that we can kind of respond to these type of uh, attacks. Lesson number two, uh, we must not be afraid. You know, God has freed us from sin and death through this elaborate plan in Jesus Christ. We must no longer be afraid of death or sin or failure because we are free from the consequences of these things. That's the point, that's the good news of the gospel. We're not free from sin, we still sin, but we're free from the consequences of these things. Okay? So we need to learn to live like sons and daughters because in Christ we will reach our ultimate potential. You know, don't judge yourself too quickly, wait for the end. And according to Jesus' promise, all of us will wear a crown uh, above the angels. And then number three, lesson number three, we must put all of our trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus came to share our experience so He could effectively help us. Uh, how foolish we are when we rely on other things to rescue us than Jesus Christ who sits above all authority and power in heaven. Imagine, we rely on ourselves or money or some other thing here below instead of relying on the one who is above to help us. Um, uh, these Jews, you know, they were being tempted to return to their temple and ritual and law to save them from persecution. And, and little did they know that only a few years after uh, they, you know, the author sent this letter, the temple and all that was precious in the Jewish religion was to be utter, utterly destroyed by a Roman army. You know, they might have gone back and felt a little secure for a while, but eventually the Jewish religion, so to speak, the core of it, the center of it, would be destroyed in 70 AD. So we need to stop trusting earthly things that will ultimately be destroyed and begin now to trust in the only one who can save us from eternal destruction, and of course, that's the glorious uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, we're going to stop here. As I said, this is, you know, this is a lot of lesson here. This is a lot of material to chew on. You know? But these things, you know, this is not the milk of the word. You know? This is the meat of the word. We're getting into the meat of the word. Anyways, uh, that's uh, lesson number three. Uh, we're going to continue in this um, intense study of the book of Hebrews, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.